Laurel Griffith and welcome to Sunday School. Today we continue our series on worship and we will be meeting King Hezekiah, uh, also found in the book of 2 Kings. So we will be in chapters 18 and 19 today. But before we turn to our focal passage of scripture, I'd like to just refresh our memory about uh, what's going on in Judah uh, about the time that all of this action will take place. So as you remember from last week's lesson, Solomon, who was the son of David, had been charged with building the temple. And so Solomon was, was faithful to complete the building of the temple. And after Solomon's reign, however, uh, the kingdom of Israel falls apart. Uh, they divide with the civil war. So there is a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is referred to as Israel and the southern kingdom is referred to as Judah. And in each of these uh, kingdoms and the division, uh, there is a series of kings that come and rule. And in the northern kingdom, each of these kings is just a disaster. Uh, they are unfaithful and they do not follow the covenant of God. They do not attempt to keep the covenant and they lead the nation into um, idol worship. In the southern kingdom, we will find a few kings that attempted to serve God, but in many instances, the kings would be faithful to some extent, but they would never totally eradicate all of the idol worship. And so around the year of 724 BC, Assyria, which is the uh, conquering world power at the time, invades the northern kingdom, which is Israel and totally wipes them out. They take all of the people away into captivity and they scatter them everywhere. And Assyria becomes the dominant force, the dominant world power, and their intent is to take over the world. Well, the Southern Kingdom, Judah, has watched this happen. The kings have watched this happen. Um, and Hezekiah has come to the throne and our passage today will tell us that he ascends the throne when he's 25 years old. His father uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord. He was an evil king. But Hezekiah comes in and is actually someone who is faithful to God. And we'll read what the scripture, how they, um, the passage describes Hezekiah. But essentially, Hezekiah um, tries to build um, a political alliance uh, with other countries that are around Judah um, that Assyria is threatening. So they, they build a coalition. Uh, to try to oppose uh, the Assyrians as the Assyrians move in on them. And the coalition is not successful, and Assyria defeats everybody else. And finally, they are poised to invade. Well, they do invade Judah, and they are poised to capture Jerusalem. So that is the scene. Um, it's, a, it's a time of great anxiety uh, and fear. Uh, the destruction, the southern kingdom has wit witnessed the destruction of the northern kingdom. And so now we pick up with Hezekiah and the description uh, that we have of Hezekiah. And then we'll stop and talk a little bit about who he is before we continue. So we'll read verses 1 through 8. 18 verses 1 through 8. In the third year of King Hoshea, son of Elah of Israel, Hezekiah, son of King Ahaz of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the high places, broke down the pillars, and cut down the sacred pole. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel so that there was no one like him among the kings of Judah after him or among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord God commanded Moses. The Lord was with him wherever he went. He prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He attacked the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. So here we see Hezekiah's uh, actions. He was in relationship with God. He had a 
commitment to God. He obeyed the commands that Moses had given the Israelites. And so he, he was faithful to God. And then the other thing that he did was he uh, set about taking down the uh, high places or the, uh, the places of idolatry that were scattered throughout the nation. So what happened uh, primarily to the Israelites in the Northern Kingdom and to the, those in Judah was something that we know as a synchronous syncretism and and that is that the people would blend the worship of the one true God of Israel with the worship of the other gods that the surrounding countries and neighbors that their neighbors worship so they would they would combine these uh, this kind of worship and they would set up altars um, around to worship them now Hezekiah's father whose name was Ahaz. You can read about that in uh, the chapters previous, prior to chapter 18. He was particularly um, evil, and he actually took uh, materials from God's temple and instructed the priests to build uh, idols or altars that would be that were similar to the idols that the Assyrian um people had used in the worship of their God. So in other words, he was he was acquiescing to the Assyrians and he was sending um, the priests the instructions to take these patterns, build some altars that look like what the Assyrians uh, had been used to worship. And so he instructed them to take the the materials from the temple and he actually put these altars up on the on the street corners. Um, and he nailed the temple, God's temple, the temple of the one true God, he nailed the doors shut. So he, he abandoned, this is Hezekiah's father, he abandoned the worship of the one true God. And so now that Hezekiah has come, Hezekiah sets about to undo what his father has done. And he destroys the idols and the high places. He gets rid of this blended kind of faith. He says, all of our allegiance as a nation is going to the one true God. He opens up the temple and he institutes the worship of God once again. And God blesses him for this. He, uh, God blesses him and gives him success and, and victory as he uh, mounts these military campaigns. Now, what we have, we have this description and then we know that um, sometime, uh, just a few years after Hezekiah assumes the throne, we have the Assyrian army led by the king and his name is Sennacherib. Sennacherib is coming uh, and knocking on the door of Jerusalem. He enters Judah and destroys some of the cities that are near Jerusalem, just cities that are just 20, 30 miles away. And he sends word and says that he is coming to Jerusalem. Now, the Assyrians were particularly brutal. They would come in and they would just decimate the land. And um, they led the uh, people away into captivity like animals. It was a, a very brutal regime. And so they used fear to try to intimidate. And so Hezekiah watches as his alliances with these other uh, kings and countries falls apart because they are destroyed. He sees these other small nations to be destroyed by the Assyrian army. And so Hezekiah makes a decision to try to make peace with the Assyrians. And he sends a, a, a peace offering. He sends some silver and some gold as a way of saying, paying tribute, that I'm going to give you this gift in hopes that you will not attack us. But since um, the Assyrians laugh at this and they, uh, they, are, they refuse to accept this or refuse to attempt to make peace. And so they are demanding actually that the, uh, is, that the, 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 the citizens of Judah, they're demanding that they surrender. Now Hezekiah not only sends this tribute, but he also fortifies the city of Jerusalem. So he looks like he's not sure what the uh, the leadership will do, and so not only is he is he determined to um, try to make peace, but he also is fortifying the city and increasing the weapons and making sure they have the water that they need in order to um, to defend the city if it comes down to this kind of battle. 
So Sennacherib says no, and um, that we're Assyria. King Sennacherib says no. Assyria is coming, and he he actually scoffs and laughs at Hezekiah, and um, at Hezekiah's men. And this is when he begins to mock uh, the one true God, and he he mocks um, God. He mocks Hezekiah, but he but he's also mocking um, the Lord God, and he's he is saying that. The Assyrians have been able to conquer all of these other gods and all of these other nations. And, and these other nations are polytheistic. They have many gods. And so it seems to, um, to Sennacherib that being a monotheistic, um, uh, a worship of one true God, that it's, it's a disadvantage because all of these other gods um, were not able to to. Uh, withstand what Assyria was going to do. And so certainly one God is not going to be able to stand up to what the Assyrians will do. So he mocks the one true God and he says um, that he is, they are going to come in and they're going to wipe out Jerusalem. And he ridicules uh, Hezekiah to the soldiers, to the men, to the people um, who were standing um, guard in this confrontation. And you can read about that in, in, throughout the chapter of 18. So in chapter 19, we come to um, this time when Hezekiah has heard um, about this. And so Hezekiah now consults the prophet Isaiah. So let me read these verses and we'll see what Hezekiah does um, as he learns about what Sennacherib is going to do, he turns his attention uh, and asks the prophet Isaiah to pray for uh, the people. When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was in charge of the palace, and Shevna, the secretary, and the senior priest, covered with sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to the birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard all the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid, because the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me, I myself will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Hezekiah sends a message to Isaiah, asking Isaiah to talk to the Lord on the behalf of Hezekiah and on the people. Isaiah uh, prays and hears from God and sends a message back to Hezekiah. And, and it's, it's important for us to know that Hezekiah enters into the temple in sackcloth and ashes. He doesn't come as a proud king, but he comes in humility uh, with the idea of repentance and confession and calling upon the name of God. He has humbled himself before God. It's also uh, important to note that Isaiah and Hezekiah have a connection. They have a relationship with one another. And throughout Hezekiah's ministry, you see that he relies upon the prophet Isaiah. So there is uh, some depth here. He and Isaiah um, see things, in, instead of being adversarial, they are working together. You know, God has raised up the prophets um, throughout the the rule of all of these kings, this, sec this succession of kings that have been so disastrous in Israel and in Judah, one after another, God um, brings up prophets. He raises up prophets and commissions them and gives them the words to say, to speak truth to the kings, to call the kings into repentance, to call the nation to repentance. And time and again, the kings ignore the prophets. They uh, even attempt to kill the prophets and uh, persecute the prophets. And the prophets are there faithfully proclaiming what God has said for them to say. But it brings nothing but hardship upon them because they are in opposition uh, to what the king wants to do. So here we have a picture of a different kind of relationship. Hezekiah uh, is listening to Isaiah and it seems that there is a level of trust there. 
And so Hezekiah appeals to Isaiah and says, call out to God. So Isaiah does and hears from God and sends a message back to Hezekiah. And it's a, it's a comforting message because he says that what God is going to do, God is going to distract um, the Assyrians and Shinnecrib is going to turn around and he's going to leave the way he came and go back home. And when he gets back home, he is going to be cut down with a sword. So God has said he is not going to let the Assyrians come in and destroy Jerusalem. So now we, uh, we, have, we go to the next part of this story, and we will look at verses 8 through 13. And I'm just going to summarize this. But what you have here is that Sennacherib sends a letter to Hezekiah. And this is a letter of threat. And he, once again, he ridicules the one true God. He is blasphemous about God. And he says he's going to come in and, to des and destroy um, Jerusalem. And so Hezekiah, who's already spoken to Isaiah through his, um, through his messengers, now turns and takes this letter and presents it um, before God. He comes himself to the temple and calls out to God. So we will read these verses. Verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Then Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste to the nations and their lands and have hurled their gods into the fire, though they were no gods, but the work of human hands, wood and stone, and so they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, I pray, from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. So this is uh, this beautiful prayer that Hezekiah prays. And it is, a, um, it is interesting to, to see here the, um, what Hezekiah does, how he moves in his thought. So first he opens the letter before God, and it's a way of saying he is, he is coming to God in faith. He is bringing his request to God. He spreads it before the Lord. There is an ex expectation here that God is going to receive him and to hear him. And then he spends a few minutes um, praying and reminding himself and calling out to God about his character, who God is. And he said he calls him the Lord, the God of Israel. So the two words that he uses for God here would be um, Elohim, which is Lord, and Yahweh, which is God. And then the description would be of Israel. So he is referring to God by these pers the personal name and by the by the title of Lord. He is he is supreme. So he is acknowledging that um, that this is the God to whom he is praying. And then he says that he is uh, seated um, between the cherubim. He is enthroned above the cherubim. You are God, you alone. All the kingdoms of the earth will worship you. And so if you remember being enthroned above the cherubim, the cherubim were on either side um, of the mercy seat at the Ark of the, of the Covenant that was in the most holy place in the tabernacle and then moved to the temple. So it is a place of, um, of enthronement. And so what Hezekiah is seeing is that God is all-powerful, that God is enthroned, that God is supreme. And so there is worship that is happening here as he uh, takes his attention to God. And he trusts that God has the power to intervene. And so he is reminding himself, even as he acknowledges who God is, Hezekiah, I believe, is reminding himself of the supremacy, the majesty of God. Then he calls him the creator, the one who has created uh, the heavens and earth. You have made the heavens and the earth. And in the, um, in the Hebrew thought, when you acknowledged God as creator or the maker of heaven and earth, you were essentially saying that he had the right to rule over what he had created. 
In other words, everything in the heavens and everything in the earth is God's. And because it because God made it, it belongs to him. And so he is able to decide uh, what he's going to do with it, what is going to happen to the heavens and the earth. It's up to God to decide because he is the creator. So you see, all of this at the beginning of this prayer is an acknowledgement of the majesty, uh, the character, the uh, power, and the supremacy of God. And as we discussed last week, it is very helpful for you and for me as we pray as individuals and also as we pray corporately to do something similar, to spend time uh, meditating, thinking, reading about the character of God, and acknowledging uh, to God who he is and, and what he has done on our behalf. It, I think it is a, allows us to see ourselves accurately that he is God and we are not, that we are limited human beings, and he is the one who has the authority to decide how things work. He is the creator. He is the one that decides um, how situation should unfold. And it also allows us to have the confidence that when we bring big prayer requests to God, like this is a very large prayer request um, that Hezekiah is bringing to God. There is no way in um, within their own abilities, their own human abilities, are they going to be able to turn away the armies of Assyria. And so he knows that he is bringing this massive prayer request before God. And only a God who is all-powerful and supreme will be able to answer it. And the same thing is true for you and for me. We hit crises in our lives, times when things feel overwhelming and so difficult. And we recognize that it's going to require a miracle. It's going to take God intervening in our lives for something to change. And so it is good for us as we pray to remind ourselves of who God is. It allows us to have the faith to pray these big and bold prayers as Hezekiah is praying. So Hezekiah, uh, Hezekiah addresses God as supreme, and then he moves to his request. And here he um, says, ask God to listen to him and to open his eyes and see what is going on. And he acknowledges that Sennacherib is now mocking God. And he also acknowledges that the kings of Assyria have wiped out all of these other nations and that these idols have been thrown into the, to the sea. Um, he's acknowledging uh, in, with this that he is dependent upon God. He is acknowledging that this is really a bad situation and that uh, he is agreeing with Sennacherib in essence and saying, yes, this is what you have done. This is what you have done. This is how you have been able to move at will and conquer all of these people. And so he's pointing this out. He's, And I think it's interesting. He's not hiding from what the facts are. He's not hiding from reality. He is acknowledging reality before God. But even as he acknowledges what has happened, there is this element of trust and faith that God is going to prevail and God is going to work and God is going to be the one that stops the Assyrians from coming in and taking over Jerusalem. So after um, Hezekiah uh, approaches God in this way and he acknowledges the reality of what is going on, in verse 19 he says, then here's his request. So now, O Lord our God, save us. He comes and he says, save us. This is what he wants. He is asking God to intervene and to stop the Assyrians from moving forward as they plan. Save us so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are God. And what he is saying is, Lord, when you intervene, when you stop the Assyrians, this is going to be such a dramatic miracle that all the kingdoms of the world will see and know that you are the one true God. He is, um, he is asking God to act on his behalf and behalf of the people, but he is also reminding God that when he acts on their behalf, that there will be a witness to who God is and God will receive the glory. All the nations of the world will see and hear and understand the one true God. So he lays this out before God, and then God now will respond. And um, the response is um, comes through Isaiah. 
and that is recorded in 20 verses 20 and following. I want us to look at the verses that were printed in our lesson, which is 29 through 31, and we'll read these and talk about them as Isaiah, Isaiah is responding and telling Hezekiah what God has said. And this shall be a sign for you this year. You will eat what grows of itself, and in the second year what springs from that. Then in the third year, sow, reap, plant vineyards, and eat fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For from Jerusalem a remnant shall go out, and from Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So what Isaiah is saying is that God has promised that he is going to stop Assyria. He's going to turn them back. He is uh, Earlier he said he's going to uh, take make sure that, uh, that, that Sennacherib is destroyed, and he actually, that actually occurs in the next chapter. We find that his own sons are the ones who, who um, kill him by the sword. And so um, God fulfills what he says he's going to do with the enemy, but he also is making this promise that says that the land of, uh, in Judah will be restored. So when the Assyrians come in, they, they do a scorched earth policy, and they totally wipe out all vegetation um, so that there's no agriculture, no harvest. All the crops are destroyed. And so God is saying that it's going to be a rough couple of years. You're going to have to forage for your food. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to scrounge around and, and live off the land. But by the third year, you're going to be able to have your agricultural uh, system back. You're going to be able to plant and harvest again. And there will be suffering in these two years, um, and but there will be a remnant that survives, and this remnant will um, be fed and, and prosper, and uh, the remnant will live successfully in Jerusalem. Um, they will be the one, the survivors, and that God's zeal, God is intent on accomplishing this so as we reflect on this biblical story, and if you've got time this week, this would be a great to go and read um, the, in all the chapters connected to this because there's, I've left out a fair number of, amount of the detail, although we've got the bulk of the story here. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing to, first of all, to focus on Hezekiah's faithfulness and his um, intent to honor God and to serve God and to worship God. And he throws himself on the mercy of God, and God responds and says, Yes, I am going to take care of you. I am going to stop the attack of Assyria. And so God intervenes in response to Hezekiah's prayer. And we know that prayer is the way we come before God, and we bring him our needs and our desires, and we approach him in times of crisis. Times of, crises. of course, we don't want to be people who only pray when something's wrong. We want to be people who have a relationship with God, where we pray to God all of the time, um, on a daily basis, and we bring him the little things in our lives, the, as well as the crises points. And it is, I think it is the daily walk with God that gives us the confidence that when something major happens in our lives, that we have the confidence to be able to pray those big prayers of faith in those times of crises. So that is something to talk about within your class this week. Um, how do your how does your daily time with God, your your ongoing prayer life with God, fuel your willingness and your ability to turn to God in times of crises? And when you how does those how do those daily prayers uh, prepare you to face the trials and the troubles of the world? And what can you learn from Hezekiah's prayer? So that's number one, a point of, for you to discuss and to reflect upon. And then the second thing that I would like to point out, and this concerns all the lessons that we are doing in the Old Testament, I think it's really easy when we come to an Old Testament story, like the one on Solomon, like the one on Hezekiah, we and Abraham uh, a couple weeks ago, we tend to look at these characters, and especially when we're studying the people that are portrayed um, in Scripture as being good people who are faithful to serve God, and we tend to look at these stories and believe they are they are accounts um, that call our attention to the character or the 
or the people that are involved in the story. And we think that that is where our attention should go. And certainly we can learn from Abraham in Solomon's prayer and Hezekiah's prayer. But even beyond this, we need to step back and to recognize that the main character in every story is God. God is the one who is acting. God is the one who is at work. And God is the one who is determined to build um, this nation of Israel, to preserve this nation of Israel, and to fulfill his promises that went all the way back to Abraham so that all the nations of the world will be blessed and of course, we know that the fulfillment will come through Jesus Christ. And so God is acting here in the history of Israel. He is preventing at this point the destruction of Judah to preserve this remnant. And this remnant, we know, eventually is going, their children are going to end up in exile in Babylon. So their, their lives, um, this story does not come to an end with Hezekiah's prayer and their deliverance from Assyria, but it just continues to become complicated because they continue to rebel. But God is determined to preserve them, and the reason he is at work within them is because he is faithful to his covenant. He is faithful to his promises, and his promise has been that he is going to bring a Messiah in the lineage of King David. And so Jesus is going to come, the Messiah who's is going to come and he is going to do the things that Israel was not able to do. Jesus is the one who's going to fulfill the covenant that Israel continued to break. Jesus is the one who's going to live the perfect life and then give himself on our behalf. So God's zeal will accomplish God's plan. God is at work. He is who he says he is. He will do what he says he will do. And we watch this plan unfold all the way through scripture, and we know that it's unfolding in our lives even now as we await the return of Jesus Christ. So step back from the lesson and reflect on what God is doing here and how God is working to bring about his great plan of redemption. And that's something to talk about in your class as well. To praise God for that, that he is faithful. He's faithful not just to his people in this moment in time. He is faithful not just to King Hezekiah, who has turned his heart to him, who worships him, and who serves him. But he is faithful to his covenant promises. And that means that he is faithful to you and to me. I hope you have a great week. May God bless you. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.